<clears throat> you ever just want to give something a facelift? Uh, yeah. You, you, ever, you know, you got a car, and uh, it look, you know, it gets you to work, but it's just kind of looking raggedy. And you wish you could go take it in, get it painted, get some body work done. Get, you know, it just feels good when you give something a facelift. And I want to talk about how we might be able to give ourselves a facelift in the new year. Because I think that as we, as we kind of traverse the community, if you pay attention, you're going to find there's some really sad people out there. There's some depressed people, some dejected people. There's some anxious people. There's some people that really need peace, joy, and love in their life. And, you know, we're going to reach them for Jesus in 2024. If we're going to have impact, the Bible says that we're going to have to be salty, right? We're salt and we're light. The light, the Bible talks about, is our good deeds. Those things that we do, uh, our actions. So it says, let those good deeds shine for all to see so they might glorify God. But there's also something that's important about who we are. You see, most of the world, the reason they're turned off to Christianity Probably, I would say, you know, if I had to guess, 80% or more, uh, it's because they see hypocrisy. They see people believing and saying one thing, but living another way or acting a different way. They see people who are talking about how God provides joy and peace and all those things, but they don't see it in their life. You see, we are to be not just... Uh, the light to the world, which is through our actions, but we need to be Jesus to the world. We need to be salty. What what makes us salty? See, so what does salt do? Salt makes us thirsty for something. And we need to live a life in such a way that people around us are thirsty for what we have. Amen? We want to, people should look at us and say, there's something different about you. You know, I, for a while, I, I wondered, you know, am I living the right way? I had somebody this week just out of nowhere in, in preparation for this. It was kind of a shock. But she goes, you know, I don't understand. She goes, I wish I could be you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, you know, I, when there's chaos going on everywhere, and even employees are acting like, you know, you know, not so good. She said, you just seem to stay focused. You're doing what you need to do. You don't look unhappy. You're not frazzled. I'm like, wow, that is amazing because I feel sometimes more frazzled than I should be. Um, but, you know, people, no, I guess I say that not to say, you know, good job, Mr. Rick. I, I don't care about that. What I care about is that we all need to think that way. We need to be thinking. People around us are watching, and they're looking for, for saltiness. They're looking for God in us. And what does the Holy Spirit do in us? He produces fruit of Love, joy, peace, patience, faithfulness, goodness, all those things, right? And so today I want to hone in on one thing that I think will rock this world more than anything else. I want to give us a facelift. So how can we get a new look and feel for the new year? In your notes, right at the very top, we can choose joy. Choose joy. If there's anything that I want us to leave with today, is I want us to leave with the fact that love, I mean, the joy, rather, is a choice. It's something that we have to decide. Now, there's more to it than that. In fact, today, we're really going to talk about, that we're going to focus most of our time today. This is a, at least a two-part message. And normally, and normally, I give you, you know, the ten things you can do to become more joyful. And that's going to come later. Today, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to talk about some of the common joy killers, things that rob us of our joy. And I'm not going to give us all the how-tos on how to take them out of our life. Hannah was chastising me yesterday. She's like, well, yeah, you, these are joy killers, but you know, how do you stop doing that? You just got to tell them to stop doing it? Well, for today, yes. <laughs> and she's right. There's more to it than that. Obviously, if there wasn't more to it than that, you know, in fact, all counselors, you, when we go through, it's like they always play this. They play this little uh, skit, I think it was from Saturday Night Live, where Bob Newhart, he's, he plays a counselor, psychologist, and somebody comes into him, and basically his answer is, stop it. <laughs> but I'm, I, you know, I, I'm scared. 
But do you want to be that way? No, so stop it. So today, I guess I'm kind of being a Bob Newhart, I'm gonna say, stop it. But you know, even though there is more to it, our decision not to engage in something, has, it has, it's more powerful than we think. Often, you know, how many times have you heard of the best counselors on one side of you? The fact is, is we all know more than we do. We just get so emotionally entangled in things that it's hard to think it through. And that's why we need counseling. But you can look and say, you know what, I'm doing this. I'm engaging, I'm allowing this particular joy killer to dominate my thoughts. You know what, I am going to stop. I'm going to do my best. And you know what, that might not completely set you free, but it will get you started. And you're on the path. And once you know what areas you like to get to work on, then you can go get help. Right? So I want you to keep that in mind today. But I want us to understand that joy is a choice. We have to choose it. it, it it's, it's not going to just come you know, naturally or, or by happenstance. Now, happiness, on the other hand, does. You can be happy. I'm happy when I buy a new car. I mean, there's nothing like new car smell. What do they put in that? I was thinking the other day. What exactly in, it makes new car smell? They've even canned it. You can buy new car smell spray. Now, it's not the same, but it's similar. You know, but there's nothing like that new car smell. I was watching, what was it, one of the Christmas shows that we watched, uh, uh, I'll, I'll Be Home for Christmas, I think it is. Oh, and uh, and uh, Eddie looks up and said, <laughs> This would smell so good on you. I got two or three words, new car smell. <laughs> and he was trying to entice a girl into his car. Anyway, we'll move on from that. But the fact is, is that, uh, what was I talking about? Now I have no idea. <laughs> that totally derailed my train. Yes, new cars can make you feel really good and make you happy for a little bit. But guess what? After you drive it for like, you know, when you buy a new car, it's like you can't wait to go to work the next day. Ooh, you drive. You know what? After three, four, or five weeks, it starts to wear off. Before you know it, you're not happy. You can be happy by going on a vacation. You know, for the next several days after the vacation, you're feeling good, but then all of a sudden, you're going to work, all the normal things. You're not happy anymore. You can be happy by doing a lot. You get a new hairstyle, you get some new clothes. There's a lot of things that can create happiness, but joy is something that transcends circumstance. It is not driven by circumstance. And that's what I'm talking about this morning. And it is a choice. And why do I know it's a choice? Because in your, in your notes this morning, Philippians 4, 4 says, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Now notice that as a command. It's not saying, I want you to be joyful because it's good for you. It doesn't say try to be joyful as much as you can. It doesn't mean, you know, if, if everything's going well, rejoice. No, it says always. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Now, if, if, if it's not a choice, how can God tell us to have joy? That would be impossible. He would be telling us, giving us command that we can't fulfill. So we know it is a choice. It's like love. The Bible says put on love every morning. That means choose it. That means get up and say, okay, today I am going to love people. That's going to be my focus. That's why James chapter 1, verses 2 through 3, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, of any kind, physical problems, sickness, financial problems, relational problems, whatever it is, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it what? An opportunity for great joy. An opportunity. That, doesn't, that means it's not going to happen automatically. It is an opportunity for us to say, you know what? I choose joy. And why would you choose joy through a trial? Of course, we're not choosing joy because of the trial. Yay, God, my car broke down. Yay, God, I'm sick. Woohoo, I lost my job. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's saying, consider an opportunity in the midst of this trial or trouble to have joy. Why? For you know, it gives the answer in verse 3, for you know that when your faith is tested, endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. What is it saying? It's saying this trial is going to make you stronger. 
If you handle it biblically, it's going to bring you closer to God. There's going to be a, a silver lining. So let this be an opportunity for you to learn how to have joy in the midst of a bad situation. So it's an opportunity which implies that it's a what? Choice. Now, what's joy going to give me? What's it going to do for me? How's it going to give me a new look and feel? In your notes. Number one, it will give me happiness. And I use that word a little loosely there. It's, it's going to give me happiness that is not driven by circumstances. If we choose joy, we're going to be happy regardless of what's going on. Because it's an internal happiness. I remember uh, many years ago, I lost my job. And at the time, I, had, I was a pastor. I had uh, no... Uh, unemployment or anything. I, I, I had been out of my field of engineering for several years, and I, you know, you, several years is like a like a millennium. You know, when it comes to engineering, things change so fast. Like software, you know, it just changes like that. And so I'm really kind of you know not sure what's going to go on. And I'm like, hmm. And God said, you know what? I got this. I want you to have joy. And I, I remember I was, we were at the zoo. I think I told you this before. I was at the zoo with the kids. You know, we had, uh, you know, the long and the short of it is that uh, it was a sudden thing, and we had planned a vacation, and it wasn't to go anywhere. We were just going to do things locally, which is what we typically do. And we're at the zoo, and I didn't want to be at the zoo, and I'm kind of like down, and God just said, you know what? Do you trust me? Do you believe I'm going to provide for you? Or are you just saying that? So that you know other people will be like, wow, you're right. And so I started to, to kind of pray and I'm like, God, forgive me for my lack of faith. Yeah, this is a bad situation. Yeah, I don't know where I'm gonna get a job. Yeah, I might have to, you know, downsize my home, might have to move. I don't know what's gonna happen. But you know, God, you're right, you're gonna take care of me. It's gonna be okay. And I chose at that moment to have joy. It didn't wash over me supernaturally. It wasn't like I'm really bummed and God just said, let me change your emotions. No, my emotions never changed. But you know, as I choose, as I chose joy, I remember this peace starting to wash over me. And I started to smile. And I was like walking around with this stupid smile. And it wasn't because of animals. <laughs> it wasn't because I was with my family. It was because God is like, I got this. Rejoice. Have fun. I will get you a new job. Don't you? You seek first the kingdom of heaven and let me take care of all your needs. And I just, this whole joy started to wash over me at that point after I chose it. And then as the joy came in, it replaced all those butterfly feelings from anxiety, all those negative feelings of depression, and just kind of washed them away. And I remember by the time I left the zoo, I was like, this is going to be okay. You know what it was? And God provided in an amazing, almost supernatural way. But it really was quite supernatural. He provided a job that I would have never sought out in a million years because it wasn't even available. And it wasn't advertised. I'm sure I've shared that story. If you want to hear it, see me later. I'm not going to worry about that right now. <laughs> but happiness that is not driven by circumstances, that's what joy is going to do for us. And number two, it's going to give me a happier, healthier, more cheerful look. When you're happy on the inside, it drives what your face does. You know what I'm saying? If you're bummed out, your face is going to look bummed out. If you're full of joy, your face is going to look like it's full of joy. It's going to give us a more cheerful look. We're going to look happier. It's going to make us more salty. We're going to have a, a, a more joyful presence, if you will. A joyful aura, if you like that word. Whatever, insert your own word, but you're going to look more joyful. And you're going to have a new look on the outside and a new feel on the inside. You see where we're going with that? You see how that all worked out? We're going to have a new look on our face and a feel. Now here's the key. It's got to be joy in the Lord. Nehemiah 8.10 says this, Don't be dejected or sad for the joy of the world. No. For the joy of your new things that you buy. No. For the joy of the entertainment. No. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
That's our joy. That's that's where our that's the what our strength is. Our joy comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from I'm so good and I will make it and I will find a way and I will do this or I. No, that's not the way it is. Our joy is in the Lord. He will provide. He will take care of me. It's realizing that nothing happens without going through the Father filter. He is a sovereign God. And if he doesn't allow it to happen, it's not going to. And that means he's in control. That means he's not going to let too much to come upon us that we can't handle. That means that he is going to cause all things to work together for those who love the Lord and call according to his purpose. It means that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. It means that we can do anything through Christ which strengthens us. Do you see this? It's all because of the Lord. And because of that relationship, because of our faith in the Lord, because we know that no matter what happens on this earth, even if we are run over by a bus and we don't make it another hour, we are going to wake up in eternity in, in God's presence, in a place of perfection, in a place where rust and moths and thieves and sin does not exist. Praise the Lord. Right? And with that, at the tip of our minds all the time, at the forefront of our mind, we're going to have joy. And here's what Proverbs says in 1513. It says, a glad heart makes a happy face. You see how that works? A glad heart. When we have joy in our heart, our face is going to light up with happiness. I want you to look at your neighbor right now. Do you see happiness in their face? If not, just say, choose joy. Go ahead. Just tell them, choose joy. Get a little accountability here. Choose joy. Try to not look happy if it just came back. Notice the reciprocal is also true. This is kind of funny. In Proverbs 15:30, it says, a cheerful look brings joy to the heart. Do you see that this reciprocal nature of this? You, your glad heart, your glad heart puts a smile on your face, and your cheerful looks bring joy to other people's hearts. That's what we want to do. We want to bring joy to other people. When we enter the church building, we ought to bring joy to the church. We shouldn't be all, mm, mm, mm. you know, we're all yours sometimes, you know. <laughs> Might as well not go to church. Probably won't do anything about it anyway. <laughs> Probably going to snow later on. You know, we're all yours, man. You tell me you know who yours is. Is there anybody here that doesn't? See, when I'm hanging out at work with the young ladies, they don't always know what I'm talking about. I say Eeyore, they're like, what? Eeyore. You know, they know Winnie the Pooh because he's the common, you know, he's the main character, but you know, he's we gotta stop that. We gotta bring joy to where we are. When we go into the workplace, we should create joy. Literally. When we walk into work, we should be so full of the joy of the Lord that we our smile brings cheer and joy to other people's hearts, which puts a smile on you their face. You see how that works? They might not know the Lord, but they can. Be cheerful. And then they'll know who's the, who's the source. They're going to figure it out. It's going to make you very salty. And combined with your good works, with your life, you're going to have opportunities to share Christ. Maybe this year, it's time for us to get a new look and feel. Amen? Amen. Anybody want that for themselves? I know I do. I know I do. So let's get into it this morning. Common joy killers. I'm going to spend the rest of our time this morning talking about joy killers. If we don't get through it all, that's all right. We'll finish in part two and go on to the new stuff. So however it works out, we'll get home in time for lunch. Okay? It's going to be okay. Here we go. The first common joy killer, and I've got ten of them here this morning, is an unhealthy focus. An unhealthy focus. In other words, what, we, what we're thinking about, what is at the forefront of our minds, what is the direction of our brains? You know, that's what a focus is. And any, if we're focused on something that's unhealthy, it, it's going to take away our joy. That's why the Bible says in Colossians 3, 2, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. I put the NIV translation here. Normally I use the NLT. And it simply says, think about things above. But I, like, I kind of like the verbiage, set your minds. It kind of, it's like lock in. You know, it's kind of like the, you know, in the military, you know, uh, movies, you know, things that they focus in. 
and you, you see the it's like a, like a jet fighter, you know, looking for a target, and then it hones in, do, 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 goes solid red. When it goes solid red, that's you're fixed on it, right? That's what we need. We need to set our mind, fix our minds on things above. Why? Because that's our home. This is temporary. Temporary. We are going to live at max about 120 years. Max. That seems like a long time, but not when you compare it to eternity, which goes on for millions and millions and millions of years. That's a long time. So we, we probably ought to set our minds on the longer part of our life, not this little teeny pebble of our life, okay? Not just on earthly things. It also tells us in Philippians 4.8, Paul says this, he's ending his letter. He's talked about all this stuff. He's like, you know, I know they're going to forget a lot of this stuff, but let me just end with something I don't want them to forget. He says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts. You see, hear that again? Fix, set. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Why would he say that? Because whatever we're focused on, that's going to drive our feelings. And when our feelings are down, we're not going to perform the way we would normally perform. We're not going to be as salty. We're not going to be as powerful. We're not even going to be able to function at work and be a better dad or mom or, or child or grandma or whatever we are. And so he says, fix your minds on those things that are good. Those other things are still going to be around. You can still pay attention when you need to fix them. But focus the majority of your time on things that are good that are pure, that are lovely, that are admirable. And guess what? You're going to feel better. You're going to think clearer. You're going to be more salty to the world. You're going to be more able to handle what life throws at you. Now, what are some unhealthy focuses? There are lots of them. And certainly we're not going to hit them all, but let me give you some real obvious ones this morning that we ought to consider kind of removing from our main repertoire of uh, thought patterns, okay? Sustained focus, an unhealthy sustained focus on, number one, problems. You say, well, i got to focus on problems. I'm going to fix them. I didn't say you shouldn't focus on them at all. I just said don't have sustained focus. You're not working on your problems 24-7. So when you're working on your problem, solve it, okay? If you got a medical problem, fine. When you're at the doctor, you got to think about your problem. When you're taking your medicine, you got to But you know, otherwise, otherwise, you don't have to think about it. It ain't going away. It's not going anywhere right now. So you might as well just ignore it and just just move on with your life. You know, think about it. So, so you get stricken with cancer, and it's terminal. Okay, that's a that's a bad thing. And I would mourn with you if you got cancer, and I hope you would mourn with me. But you know what? I got two choices. I can either a let it get me down and be sad and dejected and depressed the rest of my existence, or I can say, well, what's going to happen is going to happen. I'm going to make the most of the rest of my life. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to enjoy the rest of my life. Who would you rather? Which one's better? I think it's when they choose joy, don't you? So yeah, the problems are still going to be there. They're still going to come. Jesus said, you will have problems and trials on earth. Just count on it. But he says, I tell you these things so that you might have joy. Because when you know they're coming, you can move through them. You can realize, hey, I knew that was coming, so I'm going to like deal with it. But I'm going to have joy throughout. Because I know that God is going to get me through this. So no sustained focus on the problems. Just focus on it when you need to. And then let it alone. It won't go anywhere. Hopefully it will. And if it does, yay! Then you don't have the problem anymore. Number two, shortages. That's kind of a specific problem, is all it is. Shortages. Sometimes we focus on, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay the bills at the end of the month. Is, is thinking about it going to make it change? Nope. You're just going to make yourself sad. Think about it. Think of a plan, what you're going to do. And then forget about it. Turn it over to the Lord. That's why the Bible says, worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Thank God for what he's done, and you will experience peace that is beyond understanding. Okay? Shortages. Don't worry about them. Just turn them over to the Lord. Deal with whatever you've got to deal with, and then choose joy regardless. You know what? If you have to lose your house, you'll, you'll still make it. 
I've seen some joyful homeless people. I have. I've also seen some really anxious and depressed homeless people. We get to choose. Number three, sicknesses. And I, I kind of put it under sicknesses, but also, you know, sickness, illness, injuries, uh, handicaps, anything that isn't working physically, okay? You know, again, thinking about it's not going to make it better. In fact, quite honestly, sometimes thinking about it, getting depressed, getting anxious, having all those emotions, sometimes can uh, prolong the healing process and make it worse. We can literally get sicker. You know, there are sick people literally that think themselves into sickness. Okay, somatoform disorder, what do they call it now? The yeah. Somatoform disorder? Okay. Yeah, it's basically, you can sit and think about uh, and, and, and imagine yourself sick, and literally you can cause real life problems because of that. Number four, the past. Now, there's something we shouldn't even worry about, right? You can't, the past is the past. Can you do anything about it? Regret, that's the word right there. Oh, if I wouldn't have made that choice, guess what you did? If that wouldn't have happened, well, guess what it did? If only that didn't happen. When it's past, you know what that means? It's done. It's, it's done, it's over, we can't change a single thing, therefore let it go. Learn from it, make better choices in the future, if it was your fault, whatever, or you know, maybe you can just deal with it better as, as you go through it. But thinking about the past and, and, and swirling in regrets is a, it's, it's a loser's game right there, it really is. It's only gonna make you sad and it really doesn't change a thing, so you might as well have joy. Now, again, I'm not saying just blow it off. Hey, if there's something to learn from it, learn from it. That, that's wise. A wise person says, could I have done something different? That's wise. But once you've decided, once you've learned from it, said, okay, you know what? I will not make that choice. Anymore. I will choose this way. I will deal with it this way. All right? And then we go to God and say, God, give me strength to do that in the future. And we make that commitment. And then guess what you do at that point? You let it go. You forgive yourself. Right? God forgives you. Why don't you? Forgive yourself. Let it go. It's the past. And move forward. That's why Paul says, I, I, I turn away from the past. I look forward to what lies ahead. You know? Why? Because I can't do anything about the past. It's the past. So no regrets. Number five. Sustained focus on self. We are not made to be focused on self all the time. It's unhealthy. It's not biblical. It's hurtful to us, really. When we start thinking about self too much, then we start thinking about things like problems, our problems, our shortage, our weaknesses. And we get, you know, then we start to build that into a big snowball that really bowls us over. The fact is, is we should be focused on other people. What did I tell you? Know, what have we heard from psychologists? The number one thing, if you're depressed and you're in your home, Get out of your home, close the door, go find somebody with a need and help them. Why? Because you get your mind off self and onto somebody else. Two, you see that you're not the only one with problems because obviously they need help. And number three, it just feels good to help people. <laughs> and so we want to make sure that our thoughts are not always on self. Our thoughts should be on each other. How can I build these people up? Our thoughts should be on our coworkers. Our thoughts should be on our family. Our thoughts should be on the Lord, not on self. Number six, my desires and my dreams. Kind of another another version of self, but a little more specific. You know, sometimes you know we just we're thinking about what we want. Well, what about what other people want? What I want. What about oh, what my family wants? What I want. My dream. What about God's dreams? Does it? As a Christ follower, we're supposed to die to our dreams and desires, and we're supposed to adopt his purpose as our purpose. And so it's unhealthy for a Christ follower to think about what they want all the time. And finally, uh, number seven, too many things. <laughs> when I'm trying to focus on too many things, we are a, a society of multitaskers, and we are so proud of it. I can just do this, that, and the other all at the same time. You know what? Multitasking is not as wise as we think it is. It's not as efficient as just doing one thing and doing it right. The fact is, is that we say, well, I can recoup some time while I'm driving by 
you know, sending out all my texts and responding to emails. You're not driving very well, and one day you're going to find yourself dead <laughs> because you did that. It's not very wise. And you know, even other things that we sometimes we we try to multitask, and we end up doing two things in a very lukewarm way when we could do one thing really well. The only multitasking that we should be doing, and it's biblical, we should be working as hard as we can, but connecting with God as we do. That's our multitasking. But when we start focusing on too many things, focus on this, that, and the other, it, what does that cause? Stress. It causes stress. We start to feel anxious about things, and it removes the joy from our life. Last night, we had kind of an example of that. We're trying to, to do some, uh, we had an issue with the internet. Turned out to be Zoom setting, which I find ironic. Apparently, Zoom updated their software, didn't set it for you know, the, the uh, what do you call it, the default was not what was good for us. And it was filtering all of our music out of the worship, <laughs> which is pretty interesting. And, uh, That's been going on for a while. It has been going on for a long time. So well, I didn't hear about it till about a month and a half ago, yeah. a month ago, something like that. And then we've done several tests, and last night we just put our flag in the dirt and said, we're not leaving until this is solved. <laughs> And it was, well, let me just tell you, here's what happened. We didn't know where to start, so we were starting with the board because the board's given us some problems in the past. And I'm like, okay, maybe it's sending part of the signal. Maybe we don't have it wired correctly. So we had all these thoughts. Well, as we did it, I'm trying to, I'm like, okay, we need to hear with headphones, right? Because then we can tweet because there might be something clipping. So I tried to hook my headphones. Well, I had gotten new headphones for Christmas. They were, for some reason, not, it was, something was inter interfering with the, the, the other computer, so I'd have them and then I wouldn't, and all of a sudden, one little problem became several problems, yeah. and, and it was like this, just, it was just so much, and I'm like, okay, we gotta, okay, gotta focus on one thing at a time, so it's like, all right, phone, we're not gonna worry about that, we're gonna do it through this, okay, all right, we're not gonna worry about that, so I just started unplugging things that didn't matter. And we phoned in on one thing, got it fixed, and then one at a time fixed everything else. That was a great example of how sometimes we try to focus on too many things at once, it just robs your joy. Because I was getting kind of stressed out. You know? Just this week. Just this week. Yeah. But when I realized maybe we should just do one at a time, you know, we went a lot better. And that's kind of what we've got to do with life. One problem at a time. So work on it. Learn from it. And then stop thinking about it. You know, what we like to do is, as humans, we like to play the tapes over and over again, don't we? We record these and we play them over and over and over and over. And you know what God's telling us? He's like, you know what? Play it once, learn from it, make some corrections, take it to me, then take the tape and destroy it. Because that's what I did. I separate, you know, for example, sin as far as east is from the west. He for, when he forgives, he forgets. And that's exactly what we all right, so unhealthy focus can rob us of joy. I want, as we go through these, I mean, it, do you see yourself maybe getting caught up in some of these? Yeah. Maybe make a little mark. Okay, here's an area where I need to focus. Here's an area where I don't need to focus. I need to let this thing go. I need to learn how to not think about these things. Because just like I said, a decision and then being aware and catching yourself when you do it goes a long way towards taking us where we need to be, even without a bunch of psychological tools or even spiritual tools. Number two, unhealthy thought patterns. Now, I'm not talking about what we're focused on. I'm talking about patterns of thought here. Okay? For example, Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything. Worry is a thought pattern. What is, what is worry? Worry is negative meditation. It's looking at the possi negative possibilities and thinking about them over and over and over again as if we can make a difference that way. And we can. So the Bible says, don't worry about everything, about anything. Instead, so it gives us a substitute behavior. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he has done. And you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard our hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus. Okay? Uh, unhealthy thought patterns. Worry is one of them. Okay? Now, do we all have a tendency to do these things? Sure we do. Sure we do. But the goal is to learn this substitute behavior for some of these things. So let's go through a couple 
Um, well, a reminder, Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. You know, when, however we choose to think, it has a really big impact on who we are and what we're becoming. Um, I heard uh, Dr. John Maxwell once said that our thoughts about something, about a project, an endeavor, uh, you know, anything we intend to do, our thoughts about it have more of an impact on the outcome than our skill set. In other words, if you think you can, you probably will. You'll find a way. Even if you don't know how to do it, you'll figure it out. You'll find somebody who can help you. And so our thoughts really, really have a big impact on what we can accomplish. And you know what? Our thought patterns have a huge impact on our level of joy. And if we want to have joy, we're going to have to get out of some of these patterns. All right? I'm only going to talk about three here this morning. What's an example? And there are tons of negative thought patterns. One is worry. We talked about it in a second. Worry and fear. Okay? I'm not talking about general anxiety disorders and those sorts of things. There are different, uh, there are different things that cause anxiety in our life. Uh, for example, chemical imbalance can send signals to our body which we misinterpret as being anxious. And it can cause things all the way up to and including, um, and I can't think of the word, uh, agoraphobia, where we're so afraid to leave our house, panic attacks, all kinds of things. I'm not talking necessarily about this, although I will say that changing our way of thinking can indeed have a major impact on these things, okay? Because we are a closed loop system and, you know, everything kind of feeds into everything else. So even if we do have this kind of a disorder, we can still not maybe solve it, but make it a lot better by changing the way we think. I'm also not talking about, you know, just fear. If you're in the woods and a bear comes up behind you and you don't hear him and he goes, and you hear it like three feet away, if you don't have fear, you're going to die, okay? You might still die, but you're definitely going to die if you don't feel fear. Why? Because it, fear is not always bad. <laughs> fear says, oh, crap, I need to run or I'm going to be eaten by a bear, and it causes the what? Flight or fight or flight response. I suggest that you take the flight response because fighting a bear is not a good idea unless you have a gun. Okay? You'll fight the bear? Well, you're a big guy, so, you know, I'll... I'll, 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 I'll fight the bear. You know, I don't even care if it's a stuffed bear. I'm going to run. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh, I'm out of there, man. I'm just saying, I think I can take a koala. I'm just saying, I have a lot. I see. Well, they're asleep most of the time anyway, so you don't have much of a chance. All right, I digress. So I'm not talking about that. It's okay to experience a little bit of fear. And yes, there's sometimes, there are some very anxiety-provoking things that happen to us. And you know what? Here's the, let me just give you one little piece of advice that might help. The fact is, is most of our life is out of control. Is out of our control. Isn't it? Can you control the next breath that you take? I mean, you know, God gives it to you. You can control how you do it. I can take a deep breath. I can take a small breath. But, you know, I can't control whether I have another breath. There's really virtually almost nothing in life that we can control. Now, we have this false sense of security that we control our jobs and our finances, but we don't. And, you know, when we finally come to grips with that and we truly turn it over to the Lord, that's where the start of peace and joy takes place. When we realize, you know what, all the I thought I had control. You know what worry is? Worry is assuming, it's, it's like we assume that we have control and we can control the situation by worrying about it. But worrying doesn't do anything. In fact, it makes me less able to deal with it. And can make me sick and do all kinds of things to me. So what I'm saying is, uh, the, the, the anxiety here, the worry that I'm talking about is playing the tapes over and over again. Okay? Yes, oh, I was saying, if you are, if you are kind of, if you're faced with a lot of anxieties in life, know that you are not alone. It is probably the number two diagnosed, most diagnosed state in the world right now. Number one, okay, I don't have all the new figures. It used to be depression. Apparently it's anxiety. 
So know that you're not alone, but know that it, it, you can overcome it. And it is, a lot of it starts with just understanding that, you know what, I don't have control over it anyway. And you know what, I'm going to surrender that control to the Lord. And you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to take the place of the child. He's my dad. I'm the child. He said, if I'll just seek his kingdom and his righteousness, that he'll make sure everything's taken care of. So I'm just going to yield to him. I'm going to put him in charge. I'm going to choose not to worry about it. I'm going to choose to trust in him. And whatever happens, happens. And when we get to that point, joy truly can take over. Number two, cognitive distortions. I put everything under the umbrella of cognitive distortions. What these are is bad ways of thinking. For example, all or nothing thinking. If I don't get this job, I'm going to lose it all. If I don't get this promotion, all is lost. It's the sky is falling mentality, right? Um, you know, why is it that I always fail these things? Do you really always? You know, those are, those are fake, those are not real, they're cognitive distortions. Uh, all or nothing thinking. What are some other ones? Can't help me out here, my brain's just kind of fried. Do you have any other ones for us? Black and white thinking, there's one. It's either this or that, there is no middle of the road. Did I hear fortune telling? Fortune telling, you, you want to explain that? Yes. To the group? No, no, like, oh, it's just going to go bad. Like, right. Oh, I'm so that would be like, you know, just I negative. Way different I thought like, oh, you go see a next gypsy lady. Fortune telling, it's like, you know, okay, I'm, I know I'm going to bomb this exam. I always bomb the exam. You just did two things. First of all, do you always bomb the exam? Do, uh, you've never passed a test in your life. Number two, I'm going to I'm going to fail this test. Well, you know what? With that kind of attitude, you might. Right? That's negative thinking. So we got to be careful. There are lots of cognitive distortions. We just got to be careful and make sure our thinking is wise, that it makes sense, that it's biblical, that it's practical. If you're interested in knowing more about cognitive distortions, see Hannah after the service. She'll give me some good books. I also have some, but she is more recent, so I just defer to her. And number three, negative self-talk, which is kind of what we were talking about here. Negative self-talk, just constantly telling ourselves we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, dog on it, people don't love us, we always fail, we're probably going to fail this test, you know how you are, you always say the wrong thing. You know, a lot of cognitive, cognitive distortions get pushed into this, but just any time we're negatively talking about others, about ourselves, about our job, you know what, if your job's so bad, quit it. But don't be negative, you know, don't be thinking. Because you know what, we get ourselves into these negative thoughts and now everything is negative. And it robs us of our joy. Amen? So we've got to get out of these, these patterns of thinking. I better move on or we're never going to get through any of these. Number three, comparing myself to others. Big mistake. Big mistake. So many problems with this, I can't even, there's no way I can hit them all. But here's the thing, don't. <laughs> That's really the best thing I can tell you. I'm gonna just stop it. Okay, we're back to Bob Newhart here. Just stop it. All right. Second Corinthians 12, uh, 12 10 says, Oh, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say uh, that we are as wonderful as those other men who tell you how important they are. Paul is talking here. But they are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as a standard of measurement. How ignorant. When we compare ourselves, here's the thing. We can always find somebody that we're better than. We can find somebody that we do it better than them. We, can, we have more than them. And you know what? We can always find somebody who has more than us, who does it better than us. You know what? It's better not even to do that comparison. You know, don't, first of all, you're not my standard. Jesus is. And I'm not your standard. Jesus is. We shouldn't even be comparing ourselves. And certainly... We, we heard the story. What, what, you know, God tells a story, a, a parable. Jesus tells a story. He says, he says, you know, there's this, uh, basically, I'm going to really quickly paraphrase this for the lack of time. But he, he, he hires some people in the morning and he agrees on an hourly wage. And they start working in the field. And then he, later in the day, he hires somebody and they agree on a wage. Not per hour, but like a daily wage, what they're going to make. And at the end, somebody comes in at the la under, you know, under the wire, last hour, and he agrees to pay them. And what they find out is he's paying everybody the same. 
So some people are working all day for that amount of money. Some people work half a day for that money. And some people only work an hour. And they get the same pay. And these people come up and they're disgruntled. They say, what the heck? We worked all day. And he said, didn't you agree to work for that? I, as the owner, don't I have the right to bless people if I want to? Now think of it that way, do we? You know what God says? You know, don't I get the right? Don't I have the right to bless some people? Maybe you're not ready for that blessing. Maybe you can't handle that blessing. Maybe you haven't even heard that blessing. You know? We gotta let God decide those kind of things. We gotta realize this is not our home. You know, we'll get blessed someday. Just stick to our work. We gotta stop comparing. Don't compare ourselves to the Joneses. You know, and we gotta stop comparing ourselves to people that, that that don't know Jesus because they're this is all they're ever gonna get. Let them have their fun. Because you're going to have a lot of fun and a lot of blessings forever. And they're not going to have those things. Galatians 6, 4 through 5 says, Pay careful attention to your own work. For then you will get the satisfaction of the job well done and you won't need to what? Compare yourself to anyone else. For we, we are each responsible for our own conduct. James 3.16 says it this way, For whenever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. What is it? Jealousy. That's the key here. A lot of times we just get jealous of, of this person's that or the other person's something else. This includes, in your notes, their resources. You know, don't worry about it. So they have more resources than you. Just be glad what you have. You know what? Go to a third world country. And, and live amongst some people that, that, that you'll be a millionaire compared to them. You won't feel so bad anymore. Don't compare yourself uh, with their, their lifestyle to yours. You know, so maybe they're not a Christian. Maybe this is it for them. And you're going to have a lifestyle that's beyond anything they could ever imagine. Or maybe it's another Christ follower and they're just, God just blessing them right here because they're, they're in need of that blessing right now. But don't be, don't be jealous. Because it causes evil. It, it causes us to lose our joy. You know, when I'm thinking about what I don't have, it's not very joyful. When I'm just, thank you, God, that I do have a car. You know? I remember uh, <laughs> when I got my Fiesta. Ooh, I moved up. I had a Saturn. And I remember uh, I remember Orlando said, yeah, I remember you in the car. It was pretty Spartan. I remember him saying that word. <laughs> it was very, and it was. It did it, it was a car. If, in fact, in fact, you remember, you remember in the old days there was a, a generic brand of things, and it was like a white box with black cereal on it, you know, and that was it. That's what the Saturn was. It just, it should have been painted white with the word car on the side. It, it got me places, but there was nothing nice about it. But you know what? It got me work every day, and that's what it's supposed to do. And you know what? I know a lot of people with a lot of nicer cars, but I still got to work, and they still got to work. And you know, I know people that have to walk to work. And I know in other countries, there are lots of people that I don't know that don't even have a job to walk to. So you know what? We can always be thankful. Or we can choose to, to focus on comparing yourself to people. How about their ability? Sometimes we do that. Oh, why does it, this person plays guitar, this person sings, this person can manage this. Sometimes we even get jealous of each other's spiritual gifts. There was a huge bit of that going on in the early church in, in Corinth, and Paul had to set them, their, set them you know, straight and teach them about spiritual gifts. You can go check that out on your own. We can't compare ourselves. We, God gives us gifts according to the needs of the church. You might not have what somebody else has, but you have just what's needed. Yes. Number four, their accomplishments. You know, what they've done in life. Oh, they wrote a book and I've never done anything at all. They became the manager of some business and I've not done anything. They started a business from the ground up and they were be successful and I'm not. You know what? You have just enough time to do God's will. Get on it. Get on it. Whatever that is. Number five, their positions. Their status, their prestige. You know, oh, he, they made it to mayor. Oh, they're an elder in the church. Oh, you know what? Don't compare yourself to anybody. Just pray and ask God, what do you want me to do and do to the best of your abilities? And then you don't have to worry about those things. 
But anytime you start comparing yourselves to others, jealousy is going to set in and our joy is going to fly. Number four. What, what is a joy killer? Unhealthy behaviors. There's lots of behaviors that we engage in that simply suck the life out of our joy. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 says, you say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. There's some things that we can that we do that just ruin us, you know? They ruin us. What's that? That's not Fortnite. Fortnite? It's a the game. Okay, I've heard about it. I've never seen yes, it. It's the devil. I, you know, a lot of games are. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. A lot of games are. Do they suck the life. Mom said four nights to jail. <laughs> Mom is right. 1 <laughs> Timothy 1.19 says, Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. Some For some people have deliberately violated their consciences and as a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. Here's when we start doing things that are out of line with what we believe. When we do things that are out of line with what we know to be right, it will suck the joy out of us and it will shipwreck our faith. So we need to be careful. What are the examples of these? These are just examples. There are many. Lots of behaviors can, you can cause us to lose our joy. But number one is sin. Just any sin. What is sin? Sin by definition is basically something that's going to hurt us. It's going to hurt us, it's going to hurt somebody else, it's going to hurt our relationships, it's going to hurt our relationship with God. That's what sin basically is, in a nutshell. That's the way I view sin, okay? It's not just God trying to be mean and not let us be happy. He's saying, I made you, I know how you operate, if you do these things, it's going to hurt, okay? So he's, so we, do, we should just avoid sin. You start lying, for example, you're going to lose your joy real fast. You're going to start feeling bad about yourself for being a liar. You're going to have to cover your lies with other lies. You're going to lose track of who you told what lie to. And before you know it, you're you're a stressed out mess. You know what? It's just better to just stop doing it. Just say no to lying. Even if it hurts. Even if it makes you pay the price. Get it over with. Move on through it and you'll have more joy. All sin. You can place any sin in it. Number two, complaining. Complaining. It's a behavior. All language is a behavior. When I talk, it's a behavior. When I complain, that's a behavior. Complaining, does that not suck you joy? It's basically, it's, it's external negative talk. You know, we have internal self-talk, which is depressing, anxiety-provoking. Um, it robs our joy. And you know when we start complaining to other people, oh, why do I always have to do this? You know, that's why the Bible says when you're doing stuff, be cheerful. If you're giving and you're not cheerful, don't do it. I think that's true of all ministry. If, you're, if you are doing something for the Lord you can't, be cheerful about it. Well, just stop doing it until you get your attitude right. Don't stop forever. Just stop and get your attitude right. Then go back to it. But complaining. You know what? It doesn't do any good. If your situation is bad, change it. Pray to God, but don't complain about it. It just, it just brings you down and everybody around you. And number three, living inconsistent with your beliefs or conscience. And we talked about that earlier. Anytime you are doing something, that's a lack of integrity, and that will always suck us of our joy. And I'm going to move on quickly here. Number five, unresolved conflict. Can we understand that all conflict is going to be kind of a joy sucker, right? Whenever you're in conflict with somebody, it no matter whether you chose it or not, even if you're doing your part to stay out of it, or to, to, to keep the peace, it, it still can be a joy sign, right? So we want to try to do all that we can do to keep the peace. Romans 12, 18 says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Do all that you can. So there's some people that are just not going to be at peace with us no matter what we do. And we're just going to have to have joy do it all. You know, there are some people that are just hard to deal with. But as, it, as much as it has, as much as it's up to us, Live in peace with everybody. Because it will, it, it, that lack of conflict will just help us to have joy, right? Matthew 6, 14, 50 says, If you forgive those who sin against you, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's how serious God is about this. He's like, I don't want you to be running around all stressed out because of your conflicts. If you've got something against somebody, forgive them. 
and move on. If there's a debt to be paid, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Leave it to me. Now, what does this include? This includes failure to forgive. So if somebody in your life, if there's unforgiveness in your heart right now, and I don't care how evil it was, forgiveness is not letting them off the hook. Forgiveness is not saying it wasn't a big deal. Forgiveness is not even necessarily saying the, the relationship will continue as it is. If you're an abused spouse, you can forgive them, but that doesn't mean you let them keep doing it. Okay, that's not safe. God doesn't tell us to do that. Okay? We might have to distance ourselves, but forgiveness is this. It's saying, I'm going to let it be between you and God. It's letting God be done. Instead of me making them pay the debt, I'm saying, God, I'm going to hand it to you. You've forgiven all my debts, and I deserve hell. I deserve death, and you've forgiven me. So I'm going to forgive them, and I'm going to leave it up to you. And if you choose you know, to punish them, that is your choice, and I trust you to be a better judge than I am. That's really what forgiveness is, and it sets us free. It really is. There's a whole therapeutic method in counseling and psychology that is called forgiveness therapy. And the, the, the idea behind this is that most of our difficulties in life are driven by unforgiveness. This is not a Christian model. This is just psychology. Saying we've noticed that lack of forgiveness really hurts people themselves. And so I so God says forgive. And if you do, you know what? When you're not when you don't forgive somebody, you're playing those tapes again all the time. You have those negative feelings when they're around or when you think about them, and it sucks the joy. But you know what? It won't happen right away. But when you truly forgive and you start to let it go, and you realize God has got this. It's just like everything else. That joy just washes over all of the negative feelings. And before you know it, you don't hate it anymore. Before you know it, you're not even hurt anymore. Before you know it, you can pray for them. For the ties of that too. Number two, failure to apologize or seek forgiveness. Sometimes we do things and we don't want to ask forgiveness. You know what? That will suck your joy too. It'll cause it'll cause external conflict. There's nothing that will help a person want to work on the, the situation with you more than just finding what did you, even if they were primarily at fault, if you could find, look at, and look, look at your life and look at something you did maybe that wasn't as appropriate as it should have been and confess that and ask forgiveness and you will create an environment conducive to them wanting to do the same. So apologize whenever you can and seek forgiveness. Number three, failure to overlook petty faults. You know what? We're all surrounded by Cousin Eddie's with petty faults. You know what? we got to overlook. The Bible tells us over and over to, to, to make allowances for each other's faults. But if we don't, I had a woman that literally came to me for counseling. She was so racked with anxiety, uh, anger, so many feelings. They were big emotions. And you know what they were all driven from? A, a co-worker. There was a co-worker that she worked with that just rubbed her the wrong way. She was petty in her own right. It, you know, again, I'm only hearing this stuff secondhand, so I don't know if it's really real. You know, you, it, you learn in counseling you never trust one person's opinion about somebody else. You take it with a grain of salt, work on them, you know, let that work itself out. That you're not there, you're not dealing with them. But she had so many, she would not overlook any of the faults. She wouldn't forgive anything. And so every time this woman would come into her, you know, sphere of whatever, existence, she immediately was angry, agitated, anxious. It was like, you know, and I said, basically, you know, it's like that, it's like the blips, you know, the airline, you know, whatever the... The, the, the blips that show the airplanes and where they are, radar. you know, radar, right? Yeah, you gotta you gotta just take that little red dot off the radar. You gotta get her off your radar. The only way you're gonna get her off your radar is to forgive her, to overlook her petty faults and just not worry about it. And then you're just, she's gonna become part of the white noise. 
But as long as you keep those big emotions towards her, she will always appear on your radar screen and you will always be your kid. We've got to overlook people's bad faults. How about we have one more before we quit for the day? Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. Unhealthy attitudes. Unhealthy attitudes will keep us from experiencing joy. That's why Philippians 2.5 says you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Why? Because he was happy. He was joyful. He was full of joy. He prayed over the, the disciples that his joy would become their joy. I really wish. I Oh, it would be so awesome if I could travel through time. Man, if I had the, if I had the, uh, what was it, the uh, DeLorean and the flux capacitor, I would definitely go back and hang out with Jesus for a while. I would love to see joy in action. Because I guarantee you he had joy. And that's probably why people listened to him. It wasn't just the authority. Because I think authority without that joy probably wouldn't have gotten him where, where he needed to go. But he had the joy of his Father, the Holy Spirit. Examples of, of attitudes that we shouldn't have. Uh, and again, I can't hit them all because there are thousands of attitudes that we probably shouldn't have. But some big ones. Pessimism. Pessimism. It's always going to work out bad. I know this isn't going to happen. I know I'm not going to make this. I know that, that nobody's going to listen to me when I go out and share the good news. I know that this ministry is going to fail. I know I'm going to flunk this test. I guarantee this interview isn't going to go well. That's pessimism. And I think pessimism, number one, is a slap in the face to God. You know, we ought to, we ought to be the most faith-filled people in the world. But we shouldn't be pessimistic. We should, just, we should always be full of hope, believing in the best. It doesn't mean negative is not going to ever happen. But we know that even when something does uh, happen that's bad, we know that God is going to cause all things to work for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Amen? Amen? We know that even when trials come, he's going to help us with our endurance. He's going to draw us closer to him. So we have no reason or right to be pessimistic. And you know what? Pessimism sucks the joy out of our life probably faster than anything else. we got to learn to be optimistic. Why wouldn't we be optimistic? We serve the creator of the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Can I get an amen on that? I mean, we're not a Baptist church, but y'all can still shout it out every once in a while. It'll be okay. Amen. It'll be okay. All right? Pessimism. How about egocentrism? That's an attitude that, that we shouldn't have. Egocentrism is not the same as being necessarily egotistical. It's egocentrism is basically feeling like an, an attitude that everything is about us. You know, how does when you make a decision, how's that gonna affect how's it gonna affect me? When you do something, how will I be affected? When you make a decision, how will I be it's my health, my happiness that's most important. You know, I, I think I talked about this before, and I talked about how they did studies with kids. And uh, early kids, are they start out being egocentrical, not because they're, you know, prideful, just they just don't understand. And so when you, you go out, and if they, if they are standing here, and they're getting wet, and it's raining on them, and they go over here, and they get wet, and it's raining on them, what they, what they think is that the rain is following them. <laughs> That's a form of egocentric, uh, egocentric thinking. And you know, the world doesn't revolve around us. It revolves around Jesus Christ. And when we get that through our heads, it's going to be, it's going to be good for us. When we think it's all about us, it, it causes us to lose our joy. Because there's going to be a lot of decisions that people make that are going to affect us in a negative way. You know, people are going to get promotions that we don't get. Things are, we can't, it's not about us. So we gotta, we got to have a, a person just a negative emotion or negative attitude to have. Self-loathing, you know, sometimes we don't forgive ourselves. We don't forgive ourselves. We don't think we're good enough. You know what? You are a child of God. Look at your neighbor. You are a child of God. Tell me. Tell me. You are a child of God. Look at your neighbor and say, you are wonderfully made. That's, the, that's who you are. Here's one more. Look at your neighbor and say, you are created in the image of God. I'll just say nothing. Look, just do it. <laughs> I'll just mess. Dear God, you've got a big answer. Me too. 
You know, there's, you know what? You don't have all of the skills that everybody in the world has. Yes, you make mistakes. Yes, you are a faulty human being. You have a sinful nature, and guess what? You're in good, good uh, company because everybody else is in the same boat. No one is perfect at everything. We need to get over this whole idea that we're, you know, just not as good as. So are you saying we're made perfect, but since we've been born, the check engine light came on? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. That? Yeah, we all have a check engine light. It just means something different to everybody, you know? Just like when it comes on in a car, you know, it could be several things. Well, that's kind of the way it is. You know, we all make mistakes. We're all frail. We all fail. <laughs> Nobody's perfect, but here's the thing. You are a child of God. Stop hating yourself because God loves you. And that's where we ought to end right there. Look at your neighbor and say, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. See, now you sound like that dude on uh, Home Alone yeah, 2. Get on your knees I love you. I love you. And the last one, which is very much tied up into, it's kind of the opposite. It's perfectionism. That's a bad attitude. You know, God doesn't expect you to be perfect. He expects you to be obedient. And when you think that you're supposed to do everything perfectly, you are going to find it. Well, you're going to find failure at, at regular intervals throughout your life. And so it's best just to realize I can't be perfect, but I can do my best. And when you give it your best, you can have joy in that. Amen? When you do your best. Now, if you give it a half-hearted, I don't give a crap, you know, complaining spirit as you do it. If you give things that kind of an effort, okay, maybe you need to change something. But if you do your best, whatever that is, you give it your all, you pray about it, you include God, you do it with the joy of spirit, you know what? You've done your best, and that should bring joy to your heart. I have done all that I can do. You know, even Paul, he knew he wasn't going to reach everybody, but you know when he, when he left to kind of go to this city where he kind of feel, felt like this is pretty much it for me? What did he say? He said, you know, I've done everything I could do. I told you the truth. I didn't hold anything back. And I know that I'm going away without guilty feelings. I know that if, if you end up in hell, my hands are clean. He did his best. And he had joy in that. And that's what we need to do. I'm going to close this up there, but I want us to jump ahead because we are going to hit the very last point. I'm going to go over a few more of these next week. There are a few more anyway. And then we're going to go into some, some other issues, uh, some other things we can do to prolong joy. But I want to hit this last part. The first step in overcoming these joy killers, all of them, including the ones that I haven't even mentioned yet, is simply this. And we're kind of going full circle here. Choose joy. But notice, I've highlighted, and I want you to, to write it in there, in the Lord. Choose joy, but in the Lord. That means you focus on God's sovereignty. You focus on God's, uh, the fact that He doesn't lie. You focus on His promises. You focus on your future with the Lord. Your joy is simply in the Lord. It's not in the world. It's not in your health. It's not in your finances. It's not even in your earthly relationships. Your joy should be in the Lord. Here's, here's two keys that I want to leave us with. Number one, making the decision to live joyfully. And to continue to choose joy daily, because this is important, will go a long way towards helping me overcome the joy killers. I believe that wholeheartedly. Yes, there are more, there's more to learn. Yes, counseling helps. Yes, reading the Bible, getting more knowledge helps. Yes, there are many tools that you can use to help you. But just making the decision. And why do I know that? Because you know what? What I learned when I went to school for counseling is that just making the decision to go seek out counseling takes you a long way. And it's the first step towards healing. It takes you a long way towards the healing process. And so making the decision to choose joy and making the decision today to say, you know what, every day I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to choose joy. That's going to go a long way 
to help you overcome these joy killers. And number two, true joy is derived through my relationship with and my faith in God. It's not found in anything else. I, I, if I don't have the Lord, I don't really have the hope. I don't really have the reason for joy. You see, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Philippians 4.4, 4, we read it earlier. Always be full of joy, what? In the Lord. In the Lord. That's where the source of joy is. Very similar verse. Psalm 37, 4, take delight in the Lord. He will give you hearts to love desires. Our delight should be in the Lord and knowing Him and in, in, in giving our life to Him and letting Him take care of us and be dad to us so that we can seek first His kingdom, His righteousness, and live in joy. I believe right now in this new year, God is calling our church to choose joy. And that includes me. I don't know that I've always chosen joy. There are many days that I get distracted and I don't choose to work. And I make all kinds of excuses. I remember hearing um, Francis Chan talked about, you know, he would always teach joy, but then he's like, well, wait a minute, I'm a pastor and I get, I'm thinking about their problems and, you know, these are serious things I deal with. He's like, but you know what God's telling me? Rejoice. And the Lord always said, can I say rejoice? That includes you, Francis. Guess what? That includes me. That includes you. Let's bow our heads today as we close up our service. I believe God is calling us to, to, to cling to, to, to focus on, to choose joy in the Lord every day this new year. Last year, uh, or well, I guess it was two years ago, you know, God's Basically, for the new year, he said, I want you to learn how to walk in the Spirit. You know, every year, we get this kind of natural reset. And if we go to the Lord, he will, he will often just kind of say, okay, yeah, here's kind of an area where you're messing up. But if you change this, your life's going to change. I believe this year, God is looking at our church and saying, you know what you guys need? You need joy. You need joy. You want to have joy wherever you go. When you walk into the store, you got to have joy. When you walk into the bank, even if you're there to tell them you can't make a payment, you should have joy. When you go to work, even if you know you're going to have a tough day, you should have joy. When you go to church, you should have joy. It's a choice that you make. Yes, you're going to have problems. Yes, life's going to throw junk at you. <coughs> yes, there's going to be things that come up. But Regardless of the trial, I want you to learn how to choose joy and rejoice through in spite of it. This morning, I ask you this. Who here this morning is willing to commit to this year? Commit this morning to the Lord because I want us to, I want us to make this commitment to the Lord. Not to me, not even to each other, but to the Lord. Lord, I'm tired of living in pessimistic play. I'm tired of living in fear. I'm tired of living in depression. I'm tired of living in anxiety. I'm tired of living with a frown on my face. I'm sick of it. I'm tired of it. And I want to have joy. I want to have joy so that I'm happy regardless of circumstances. Are you willing to make that commitment to every day? I'm not talking about today only. I'm talking about every day in 2024 to wake up in the morning and say, God, I choose joy. I choose to walk in joy. I choose to be joyful through whatever happens today. Whatever problems, whatever good happens, it doesn't matter. I choose to live a joyful life this day. Are you willing to commit to that right? And if you are, right there where you sit, you can come forward. If it helps you to make that commitment, come forward, kneel, kneel down here, and go to the back of the room, kneel. I don't, I don't care where you pray. Like lift your hands to the Lord as you pray, whatever you want to do. But will you say, Lord, yes, I will commit. 
And the one thing I will ask you to do is that if you're going to make this commitment, will you please, while we're praying, just take out your communication card. It's okay to open your eyes. Nobody's going to give you a hard time. Like when you were a kid, you were praying at the table and your sister saw that you weren't, your eyes weren't closed and she told them, it's not that way. I want you to take out your communication card and I want you to write joy 2024. All right? Robert's already kind of called us to do that. Let's take a few moments to deal with what we need to deal with to go before God and say yes. just want to take a moment to lift over, lift up everyone in this room here and everyone online, and everyone who's ever going to listen to this message online. I just lift them up to you right now. And I ask you, fill them with your Holy Spirit. Father, that you fill them to the brim. Father, that you draw them. That you show them who you are. Help them to experience your love. Father, help them to, to know you so well that they have faith in you, that they will trust in you to do what you said you do. Father, that they might have all the tools they need to choose joy. Lord, problems are going to happen anyway. We're going to have problems we're going to have shortages. We're going to have conflict. We're going to have things that don't work. We're going to have sicknesses. We're going to have handicaps. We're going to have all those things. Lord, we can either have them and be unhappy and be pessimistic and negative, and depressed and anxious and fearful. Or we can have them and we can have joy we can make the most of every opportunity with our life because we, we have the joy of the Lord and it becomes our strength. Lord, I pray that the joy of the Lord will be our strength in 2024. Father, I pray for healing. I know there's people probably even in this room who have different issues with depression and anxiety and they're they're clinical. They're above the typical norm. Lord, I pray for them for healing. Lord, I pray that, that there would be healing in the mind, healing in the chemistry, healing in all of those things that create those issues for us. Lord, I pray that for those who are dealing with things that are maybe outside of the normal realm, that you would just right now draw them to go out into the world and get help. Lord, because... I know that you don't want us to live in that, but you want us to have joy. Lord, but right now, regardless of the situation, I just pray supernaturally right now that you would fill us, that you would help us to experience your love, that you remind us 
of your sovereign nature hand on our life. Lord, that we would have at least enough hope that we can say, God, today, I don't know how long it's going to last, I don't know how we're going to overcome some of these difficulties, but for now, as best as I can, I choose joy in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.